Hi everyone, uh, my name is Steve Bromley. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really happy to be talking to you about collaboration between researchers and other disciplines. I personally think as a researcher develops, soft skills become key to having an impact with your studies. And today I'm glad to be having the opportunity to talk to you more about this. So first of all, a bit about me and my background. I was a user researcher at PlayStation and their team in London for about five years. Since then, I've left games and I'm working to help set up some new user research teams in other industries, but I've still had the opportunity to work with some games teams and some VR studios, which has been really exciting to keep up with it all. I also started and continue to run the Games User Research Mentoring Scheme. I have a bit more to talk about that related to that at the end of this talk, so we'll come back to that later. But on to what we're going to cover today. So, as we know, making a game is very hard. It involves decisions throughout the development process. Big decisions early on, such as what should the game be about? Uh, go, moving on towards smaller decisions later on, such as how do we make sure the player is looking in the right way to see this interaction or this event that happened in the game? And luckily, as user researchers, we have a variety of methods that reveal information to help make that decision making easier. We understand from our studies what issues players encounter, why those issues occurred, and that can help us create the, a better experience in the way that the designer intended. But there's a problem. We are not designers, and it's not us, the researchers, who are making those decisions about how to fix the issues that we see in our studies. This creates a communication gap between us researchers who have relevant information that will help and the people who need to use that information to make decisions. Much like a tree falling in a forest, a research study makes no sound if decision makers don't use the information we're learning. Today, we're going to look at some reasons why that problem occurs and also some techniques to help overcome that problem and help increase the impact of the research studies we are running. There's a couple of reasons why this is important. As we know, research helps us find problems earlier than waiting until the game is launched and then finding out all these problems with the game. And so it helps us make better things. It's useful to learn that earlier in development so that we can iterate it before it's launched and come to a better implementation of the idea by the time it hits launch. Also, as we know, it's much cheaper to fix those problems earlier. It's cheaper to fix an idea that you have and change your idea um, before you make a prototype. It's cheaper to change a prototype than it is to change a game in production. And it's cheaper to change a game in production than it is to change one post-launch. So as researchers, we believe it's better to resolve those ideas early and avoid wasting development time. Today, we're going to look at three reasons why this might happen. The first, that people are unaware that research is occurring. The second, people don't care that research is happening. And the third, that people misunderstand the findings from research. I believe that by understanding these issues, we can help overcome them and increase the impact of our research studies. So the first problem, people don't know research has occurred. As we know, game development is very busy and developers, producers, designers are very busy people with many conflicting demands on their time and they're unlikely to actively seek out information. That's particularly the case when they don't know the information is out there if they don't know that research has occurred, they're not going to go out and actively seek, oh, has some research happened uh, related to this subject? It can feel like a waste of their time uh, to have a look without knowing whether they're gonna find some research or not. This is a bad thing for us. If people are unaware that research findings exist, they won't seek them out, they won't discover them, and they won't use that information to inform the decisions they're making for design. What this means for a research team is that we need to aggressively over communicate the studies that we're running and that we're running studies at all. 
There's a lot of techniques that you can use to do this, and I personally prefer combining them all, so using all of these together. Some of them include being very active on internal comms tools like Slack, having your own channel for user research, but also following the discussions in the other channel and piping up when you're aware that a relevant study has information that's helpful to the team's uh, discussion that they're having. As a research team, you can also run an internal newsletter to update everyone on the studies that you're running and some of the key findings that you found. And also blog posts, both internally, uh, if you want to communicate specific findings, or externally, if your goal is just to say, the research team is out here and we're doing studies. And if you work at the same company as us, please keep an eye on the type of thing that we're doing. Also, making sure that you take every opportunity to talk at internal team meetings, whether you have regular show and tells or regular huddles uh, meetings where everyone gives an update on what their team has been doing recently. Making sure that user research is always represented in that space and that every study that you're running is described so that teams both know what work you have done and that you're available to do work. And this can be combined with an internal team site on an intranet. For example, listing all your previous research studies, listing some of the uh, reports if you're creating reports, and also giving details of how teams can approach you to commission further studies. An example of where this work has gone really well in the past is with GDS, the Government Digital Service in the UK. You might be familiar with some of the posters that they've uh, created in the past. I've got some examples here, but there are many other examples of the posters that GDS have been making. They uh, took an aggressive essentially a propaganda campaign to push some of the principles of user-centered design and push the idea of evidence-based decision making, making sure that their posters were visible in all internal spaces inside their workplace, using things like stickers so that uh, people could attach them to their laptops to show allegiance to some of these principles, and creating a buzz about user-centered design as a result of this. They did it with principles, but it doesn't have to just be done with user-centered principles. Uh, you could also use posters and prominently display in real-world spaces some of the key findings from research studies or upcoming research studies you're running or congratulating a team who have run a, a many research studies with you. And this will help create awareness that your team exists, that you're running studies, and also interest that might intrigue someone to think, oh, that finding looks kind of related to, to the work I'm doing. I should go seek out the team and ask them about the work that they've done recently. There are techniques to take this even further, and you've probably seen in the wider user research community people talking about research repositories a lot recently. So one of the challenges we have as user researchers is we do run individual studies, and often that study, you create a report at the end, and you have some findings inside the report. Often those findings might be relevant not just at that time that that study was run, but they might be relevant again in the future. For example, if you're finding some universal truths about user behavior or finding some best practices around tutorials, just because you found that on a usability study doesn't mean that it's only useful then. Your team might uh, create tutorials in the future and want to know about this in the future. The issue we have is because that information is captured in a report, it's hard to discover. The team will need to know which report has that information in order to look at the findings you've found about tutorials. The idea of a research repository is to fix this problem. They uh, take all the individual findings from the report and put it in a database using uh, this bespoke tools, but you can use things like Airtable or any sort of database software that captures both the, the insights, the thing that you learnt, but also some tags that make it discoverable in the future. So we found this finding, it was about tutorials, and it was about this game, could all be tags that you would attach to your finding. And then in the future, someone can uh, run a query on a database and return all the findings that have ever been found about tutorials if they're looking at tutorials again in the future. This overcomes the issue of people needing to know what report it is to look at to find each specific finding that you've ever found about tutorials. It's particularly useful when you have streams of data. So for example, if you're running regular player surveys or asking for player feedback regularly, particularly if uh, you're looking at churn, you're looking at when players leave, what reasons they give for leaving, you're not going to interpret all of that data immediately and it's a continual flow of data coming in. 
But if you're tagging it, uh, you can later run queries against the data so that you can uh, look through all the player feedback to find anything e anyone ever mentioned about tutorials and then analyze that raw data better. This, as you can imagine you can see, can be dangerous. By giving this control to teams to allow them to query the data themselves, they could search for evidence for their pre-existing conclusions. If they think that the jump is floaty, they could search for jump, find 50 responses that say the jump is floaty and say, look, 50 players said the jump is floaty. But without the context of seeing the study, you don't know how important those findings were when they were found. And it might just be evidence for an agenda that someone has. So as a researcher, we need to be careful about both who we allow to use databases like this, but also what conclusions are drawn and make sure we still have a quality control over what conclusions are being drawn from the data. But it is an interesting area and I can see why research teams are exploring it further. And so we've seen some techniques such as active communication and propaganda that will help people know when research is occurring and what research has occurred. The second problem I want to talk about today is that people might not care that research has occurred. This describes when someone knows a study has occurred, but they're not using it to inform their decision making. This can occur for a variety of reasons. Some of them are simple, some of them can be very complex to solve. It could be just that people don't see why this study is relevant to them or what they've been working on recently. It can be challenges thinking, okay, I've answered there's a problem, but I don't know what to do about that problem in order to resolve, the, uh, resolve it in my game. One of the hardest issues that teams might have to resolve is when the incentives don't promote evidence-based decision-making. There's a saying it, uh, that it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. And as researchers, we're very interested in ensuring that people have a positive player experience, but perhaps that's not the motivation of every uh, person that we interact with in game development. So some techniques that we can use to help address this and help people care that research has occurred and that they want to use the findings based on it. The first is taking that GDS work we looked at earlier, advocacy and promoting evidence-based decision-making, using techniques like posters, stickers, talking about it a lot, sharing case studies, can get people excited about user-centered design, making decisions based on user research, and can just make people feel more engaged with the process and care about it. Also, as researchers, we need to understand the people we're working with and their incentives. The first research interviews we should be running when we work with a new team is with that new team to understand what problems do they have, what's their previous experience with user research, and what we can be doing that makes their lives easier. For some people, their goal is to speed up development time, and we could be explaining how research can help speed up development time. But others, they might want to create the best player experience that's ever been made. And again, we can help describe how user research can help make better player experiences. But we need to spend that time to understand people and their motivations that we work with so that we can describe our research studies in the right way to convince them. Another thing that's essential for making people care about research is to make sure we're defining our research objectives together. Rather than just a researcher going away and thinking about what do I want to run a study about, they should be meeting with their team members, understand the current decisions that their team members are about to make, and then plotting their research studies so that they give relevant information at the right time for the team's priorities. The, another technique, and I think we'll talk more about this later on in this presentation, is using workshops to help address the issues. So not just presenting problems to the teams, but helping them come up with the solutions collaboratively by facilitating workshops and helping them take action based on what they're learning from your reports. But as I say, we'll look at this in more depth in a second. One technique that I found helps a lot with this is collaborative analysis. 
So as you know, traditionally, a user researcher will run a study. They'll collect some data, either by observing issues or by looking at uh, player survey feedback or by looking at analytics. They'll go away, analyze that data and come back with a report. That's fine, uh, it's efficient, but it doesn't create a high level of engagement between the game team and the findings that you're presenting. Another technique to help address this is running that data analysis as a collaborative session with your game team, with your designers, with your producers, with the developers. To make that work, everyone needs to understand the research objectives beforehand and needs to observe players themselves. They need to be watching the players playing or watching videos of the players playing and writing down notes of the issues that they see where the player hasn't understood where they're meant to go, hasn't understood what they're meant to do, or other observations related to the research objectives emerged. We'll then ask them to write their observations down on post-it notes and then run a session where we've prepared areas in a room with topics that could be levels, that could be features, it could be screens that appear in the game and ask people in turn to look at their observations and stick them next to the re relevant topic. Then as a group you can aggregate them like you would with affinity mapping normally to draw out one of the key themes about the observations that have been made and together decide what are the top issues that have emerged. This doesn't replace analysis as we know researchers have special skills that enable them to uh, identify issues or describe issues better than a layperson. But by starting analysis with a group session, it gets everyone feeling invested in the research and like it's their own work. And then when it comes to presenting the report after the researcher has taken those initial groupings away, done some work to investigate and describe the issues, and comes to present them back to the game team, it means the game team will recognise the findings and feel like it's their own work, potentially uh, making them more likely to do something about the findings that they've seen. So those were some techniques to help address the problem of people not caring that research has occurred. The final problem I want to talk about today is that people might not understand research findings. This describes when they both are aware of studies happened, they have, uh, they care about the research and they've seen uh, a report and they want to do something about the problems that they've seen, but then they go and do the wrong thing as a result of trying to fix the problem. This can be due to a misunderstanding, obviously, and it's potentially worse than some of the other problems of sin otherwise, because people have a high, will have a high confidence in making the wrong decision because they think they've understood the issue when they haven't. Rather than being unsure about it and having doubts, they're gonna be confident they're doing the right thing, even when they're doing the wrong thing. So the key technique that researchers need to be thinking about to address this is making sure that people can interpret our findings to come to the correct conclusion. For every finding that we have, we need to uh, be describing why did it occur? What is it about the game that caused the player to do this action? So that the finding can be targeted at the right thing. And also help describe what the impact of that issue was. So because of that issue, what did the player do that was wrong? Again, that will help people decide how severe this issue is. If a player wasted only one minute of their time as a result of this issue, that's less severe than someone who wasted three hours of their time. And this will help our uh, colleagues in design and producers prioritize the findings that we're presenting. So an example of a poorly described issue is this one on the side that says, people were unhappy with the story choices they had made in Batman the Telltale Story series. It's clear that's an issue, people are unhappy and there's a problem there, but it's not clear why that issue occurred. It could be there's not enough story choices. It could be that the story choices, how they were described was misleading and people thought Batman was going to do one thing and he went and did something completely different. Or it could be any other reason why it occurred. So to address this, we need to be making sure to describe why the issue occurred. What is it in the game that made that issue happen? and also the impact, what did that cause players to do? When the same issue is fully described in that way, we can see that actually people are unhappy because they 
couldn't see the story options and they didn't know they were making choices in the game which made them sad because they then made important decisions without being aware that there were other options available to them. That makes it much clearer to the game team, okay, what is the problem? The problem is the legibility of the options and increases the chance they're going to take the right action to fix it. Of course, this is easy for usability issues like the one described here, but it's still relevant for all types of issues, whether you're describing problems with the game or just describing player behavior in general to help inform game design decisions we need to be make, making sure we're comprehensive about how we describe them. Another thing I think is very important when researchers are describing their findings is describing the limitations and the unknowns from their study. So every study has limitations or caveats due to being pragmatic. We can't see 100 users before for every usability study, so there are going to be some usability findings that are going to be unrepresented we can't see every type of user for every type of study, so there's going to be some audiences who are not represented. And we need to be honest to our game teams about these limitations. Some of the limitations might be due to the method, some might be due to the sample, the type of people that we could get, and some might be due to the context. For example, it was a lab-based study, and so we didn't see some issues that might only occur in a player's own living space with motion-based games. By acknowledging these limitations or the caveats with each of our individual studies, it helps build trust. It helps teams recognise, okay, this researcher will say things they're not confident about, and so the things they are telling me they must be confident about, and again increases the likelihood they're going to take action based on the findings you're presenting. And ultimately that leads to better quality decision making. We don't want game teams to have high confidence in a finding that we're not confident about, and then take the wrong decision. We need to be clear about the limitations of our work. A related topic is about recommendations. So the problem we've been trying to fix with this problem we're describing is that teams might not take the right action based on our presenting our findings. One way you could address that is a researcher could say what, what to do about it. In that Batman issue we saw, we could say, why not make the story options bigger and then that they'll be more legible and people will be able to see the options. However, there's, this might be naive when done by researchers alone. We might we don't understand the other disciplines' background as well as uh, they do. So we might be describing things that are technically not possible, that a developer would recognise this isn't technically possible. We might be presenting things that take a long time to develop, which a producer would recognise, oh, we don't have time to do this. Or we might be describing things that are not an ideal solution or not aesthetically good, which again a graphic designer or a UX designer would recognise as not a good solution. So we can look naive if we're giving recommendations unprompted and again this will impact trust in our research skills. However we also do have expertise, we know a lot about player behaviour, we've seen a lot of players interact with games and so we have relevant information that we want to share and so there is a way to address this which is collaborative workshops which is the last thing I want to talk about. So it's very common for a research team to write a report of their research findings and then present them to the game team. However, this doesn't have to be the end of the interaction that we have with our game teams. And you can follow up that report presentation with a workshop deciding what should we do about the research findings we've just heard, which can help reduce misunderstanding. A format for that can be returning to each of the top findings from your report and asking everyone individually to come up with two to three potential solutions, again writing them on post-it notes, and then presenting them to the group. As a group, you can evaluate each of the solutions, uh, giving input based on your discipline. So a user researcher can add some assessment based on their understanding of player behaviour, a developer can talk about what's technically feasible, a producer can talk about what we have time for, and together you can decide on what is the best solution or combine multiple of them to make a combined best solution. You can then decide wh uh, who's going to take this fix forward and who's responsible for it and work through each of the top priority issues in turn until each of them has a resolution or at least exploring a fix assigned to someone. 
And this will help teams make sure that they're doing something based on the findings that you're presenting and that they've understood them correctly. So to sum up what I hope to have talked about today, I believe that better communication will increase the impact of our work. As user researchers, we put a lot of expertise into planning and running high quality studies. And it's a shame where that doesn't have the impact it deserves due to team members not understanding or not caring about research findings. But hopefully today we've talked about some techniques that can be helpful to help people understand them and take the right actions based on them. There's one last thing I wanted to cover today. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I run the mentoring scheme and I'm very interested in helping new people join the industry, uh, become user researchers and develop early stages in their career. In 2021, I am releasing another book. It's called How to Be a Games User Researcher, which aims to help people discover what a games user researcher does and how to be one. It covers how games get made and what the different parts of game design are and the type of people that will be interacting with as a user researcher. It talks about how to run high quality user research studies and exactly what the job of being a user researcher is. And it also has career and development tips to help people get their first job in the games industry. If you're interested, there's a website, gamesuserresearch.com, which is the place to look to uh, get the updates about this. It also has a mailing list on it. So if you want to make sure you don't miss it, do sign up to the mailing list. Um, I also think there'll be an early discount for people who are on the mailing list. So it's worth doing if you think you want to get the book. And that's everything from me. Thank you for the opportunity today to uh, share my thinking about research and research impact. I've really enjoyed it. If you're interested in keeping up with the things that I'm up to, do follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is on there, at Steve underscore Bromley. But today from me, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.